everyone, and welcome to Hit and Hustle from IrishSportsDaily.com. I'm your host, Greg Flamong, and with me, as always, is Jamie Uyama, Mr. Jamie University. Tuesday, March 26th, we were greeted with some bad news this morning. Uh, ben Morrison went under uh, the knife. He had surgery on his shoulder. Got a lot of sh- shoulder injuries are going around, Jamie, as as everyone can see. Jamie's in a sling. Uh, we got a lot of shoulder problems going on. Maybe Ben Morrison was playing hockey, Jamie. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe. Uh, so, you know, someone landed full body weight on him, and so now he's got a shoulder injury. But uh, Notre Dame fans were greeted with that news. He's going to be out for the remainder of spring practice. And I got to tell you, last, last sentence, Jamie, I did not like – it, it it could have worded it a little bit better. It sounds like he'll be fine for the season, but expected to return for twenty twenty four. What okay? Like I maybe maybe word it a different way. Uh, expected to be ready for the 2020, 2024 season. Expect to be ready for fall camp. I, I, we don't really know the nature of that injury. That's going to be very difficult uh, to figure out uh, today, at least. Um, Maybe there'll be more information once Marcus Freeman talks to the media again. But uh, we were greeted with that news. And then over the weekend, Notre Dame uh, announced that Riley Leonard had, had another surgery on his ankle. So he's going to miss probably the remainder of spring ball. Marcus Freeman left it open a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, could he actually come back? I don't know. It seems like not. You, you, you're going to have surgery on the ankle. You've already had multiple surgeries on the ankle uh, as it is. It, what are you going to bring him back for the spring game? Like that's not going to doesn't make sense. No. Yeah. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So expect for him to miss the bulk of spring practice. So uh, that's the news. We're going to discuss that. Uh, we're going to discuss all the other news and notes and, um, and you know, we're, we're going to, we're also going to build, we're going to start a new segment called if you build it, we're going to build a perfect quarterback. We're going to start doing those things uh, during the off season. So thank you everyone for tuning in. If this is your first time catching our show, Please hit the like button. Please hit subscribe. Please hit the notification bell so you never you know whenever it is we are going live. Links to the podcast are in the description below, and uh, you can check us out there on the audio format if that's your preferred <clears throat> way of doing things. Um, Jamie, first of all, how's your shoulder? How are you doing? Are, are, are you are getting you- better? Getting better every day. Um, you know, just all I can ask right now. That's just progressing that's that's about the only update i can give so i'm having a hard time with uh you know mike and and christian are on power hour giving my guy slack you know giving you a hard oh, time yeah. it's terrible jamie oh it's, well you're out, here, you're my... out here no 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 it's all fun and games and they're making jokes you're out here hyping up uh articles writing articles one hand two hand your wife is 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 doing performing her, her physio duties. You're 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 making it happen for the team. I I feel like that should be noted by everyone. Um, you know, yeah, 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 this is a real thing that's going on. Well, so we, you, you, you know how it is with with uh, m- with Mike and Christian. Uh, publicly, they tease, but uh, privately, they're supportive. So that, they're very that's, supportive. that's why. They're that's very why supportive. I can. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I'm just saying I'm sticking up for my guy on yeah. hitting us. Oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah, yeah, it. For sure. No problem. No problem. All right, Jamie. Uh, let's start with Ben Morrison since that's the the new news of the day. Uh, shoulder injury, right? Um, I think it's kind of like the Riley Leonard thing, right? Like, okay, Christian Gray, you know, put him on the boundary. Let's see how it goes. Uh, Jade Mickey's going to get a ton of reps. Uh, a bunch of other corners, all the other corners, just like everyone just kind of moves up on the reps uh, aspect of it. Uh, Jamie, what what do, what do you take from this? Is it, is it a big deal uh, given what we know right now? I mean, it could be a big deal, but I think it's because – but we just don't know right. like that. Like you said, that wording there at the end, you didn't say at the, for the start of whatever, it didn't say he's back for camp. Um, certainly everybody's thinking about Texas A&M. Is he, mm. is he going to be ready for Texas A&M? Uh, you know, I think everybody knows that follows Notre Dame football, that Ben Morrison is an elite corner. Um Look at what he did against um, the top boundary receivers they faced last year, right? Yeah. Like those guys pretty much got nothing. 
against him uh, uh, when, when they were matched up with him. Right. And he was the one guy too, right? Like you can say that um, certainly there's cases too, where they were helping with Marvin Harrison jr. Uh, you know, over the top in some cases, cause they didn't want to give him too many one-on-ones, but he had him one-on-one quite a bit. And he's someone who's, you could put one-on-one against pretty much anyone. And, to have to not have that is would be a big deal. Would be a big deal, right? Yeah. That's how someone like you know Stanford's El- Elikai Manor could go off against somebody else. I mean, he certainly. This is w- which I've, I'm always going to push back against the Travis Hunter as cornerback one. I know the guy's playing both ways and stuff, but I mean, he got cooked by Elikai Manor, and that did not happen to uh, Benjamin Morrison. Um, you know, so. I think if if he's not unavailable for any amount of games, it's not a good thing, right? It's, it's obviously not a good thing. He's a he's a, he's an all American. He's one of the best in the country. Um, so to not have him will be bad. In saying that, it's just like the same kind of thing with Leonard, where it's you're going to get these guys with opportunities now. And like you said, you mentioned Gray on the boundary, which I think is that's where he's going to play. Long term, that's where when Morrison is gone, Christian Gray will be the boundary starting boundary corner for, yeah. uh, you know, uh, for for Notre Dame. I, I don't think too many people have any doubts about that. So you're going to have him kind of have to take on that role. Um, I think certainly Mickey, what it does for Mickey is it kind of like he kind of solidifies it. It's like, wow, this is your kind of spot here at the field. And now you got to kind of run with it and and be at a certain level, right? And this is also too when you come down to it. Obviously, you look at you know they're gonna ha- they have freshmen that uh, you wouldn't expect to play, but now maybe those guys will have to play for at least a little bit, right? So we don't know. We have to see what they have in Leonard Moore, and obviously Carson Hobbs isn't on campus yet as competing so we'll see there the other thing is clarence lewis like it's exactly why you want to have someone you just just insurance it's insurance right and clarence lewis you know yeah do you want him to be matched up against the top top guys in the country no do you want him on the boundary taking ben morse's place no but i think if i was if you're going to start him at field or play him even a bit at field, he can play. Yeah, he can play, and I think he's actually a, a a much better field corner and like a pretty solid field corner. Um, and you're just like for the one thing, and I'll, I mean, I have to go back and kind of look at like you know, and I, I still am waiting to kind of see because you have to. There's so much that changes with the transfer portal in terms of uh, the. Uh, you know, rosters and stuff and and who gets added because like, who knows, like Florida State just got Keon Coleman after last spring, right? Mm -hmm. And that obviously changed their thing. But I got to look at all the kind of receivers, but just on paper right now, I don't think Notre Dame's facing as many good receivers as they were a year ago, right? So So that certainly isn't, you know, a bad thing, right? Like they're not... uh, there's just there's less guys that you would have to worry about as like oh this guy's an elite guy that you have to match up against, so that's part of the equation too. But it also just brings into it where, well, do you if he's out for any extended amount of time, what do you do you change the approach in terms of how much you pressure, and all that kind of stuff? Because yeah. if you, I mean, they're a high high pressure team, they're a high man coverage team last year. Maybe you aren't gonna play as much man if that's the case so i'll be interested to to see what happens there and, and what you think about that um yeah i mean i, I it's just so hard to say, it's so hard to say right it's like, hard to just, say without we, we don't we don't know that. where 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 it's at I, I in my opinion like with his shoulder I, I don't i don't i don't know like a ton about shoulder injuries i don't know that many they're like yeah he's out for six months like i it would it would have to be so bad and it, it sounds like 
it sounds like this is something that maybe they tried to uh, I don't I don't want to say play through but like it it they decided to do this. It sounded like it I, I don't know that it happened in practice or I don't know when it happened but it just yeah, we don't I, know I the details, like, yeah. yeah, we don't know the details but it just seems to me that like it, I I don't think this was an injury and then right to right to surgery. I I don't think that's how it happened. So I, to me it's like he'll probably be back for fall camp. He'll probably be back for the first game. It's not a huge deal, right? Uh, so I, I don't want to freak out about that. Uh, Luke, but should he not be available? I mean, like to Coach Hump, Coach Humph is making the point of, like, what's the point of speaking so glowingly about Coach Mickens if we don't think he's raised the level of the cornerback room to the point where we actually have more than one Morrison? I have zero I mean, concerns. Uh, so but he's he's – he could be a first team all American at corner. And like, is it possible that Christian Gray could get to that level? It is possible, right? Is it possible that Leonard Moore could? I don't think personally, I don't think Jaden Mickey has that in his bag. It's my opinion. He's a good player, right? He's fine. But I, I don't think he's like first team all American. Like, like Ben Morrison is a special, special player. I mean, as soon as he stepped on campus, he was locking guys up right i mean just like took the number one spot like immediately right so he's he's a special athlete you just don't have guys like that like so it, it wouldn't be a knock on on mickens to say like hey ben morrison's out this is a a problem you know <laughs> like it is a problem and i i don't think I, I think you could still say coach mickens is doing a good job back there yeah uh but like you you lose a guy like ben morris i mean it's just like it's, it's just anybody. Like and, I don't care. Name a team. Name, uh, you know, name, uh, Al, you know, Georgia, Alabama, whatever. They lose Ben Morrison. It's the same thing, right? It's not. It's. I mean, and first of all, too, like we're talking like he's going to be out for. We don't know, right? But I'm just, just hypothetically, like there just isn't somebody who you know. It's not. Not only is he an all American, or He's going to be like a top 15 pick. He's probably the best corner that Notre Dame has had in like since like Todd Light. Probably like Bobby right? like, Taylor or something. Yeah, like, Bobby Taylor, Taylor, right? He's really yeah. good. Like, so, I, I mean, <laughs> it's not even to say that those the rest of the guys won't be great or they can't be fine and survive totally and still play great defense without him. Because I don't believe like when Ben Morrison leaves that Notre Dame's going to stop being good at corner. I still think they're going to be very good at corner, but they might not have a Ben Moore. Like, it's just, it's just one of those things where like, I mean, you know, Alabama didn't, have, even though as good as their corners were this year for Alabama, like they're not Patrick Sertain. You know what I mean? Like they weren't at that level and that's kind of the level that Morrison is at. So I, I don't think it's like, it's, it's nothing against Mickens or it's nothing against even the other guys on the team. It's just that, how many corners are there that have had his kind of ball production that have gone against other top guys as true sophomores and like shut them down? Um, and, you know, he's probably going to take it to another level this year. Right. So I just think it's, you know, it, it's totally fair to be like, man, they're going to, they're going to miss him if he's not available. Um, I, I would say too, just the one thing I wanted to add in terms of like, the wording of the injury and all that. Like, I think that, uh, and, and it's something that with, with, with Marcus Freeman too, cause he's, you know, you know, Greg, as you know, we, we've talked about this plenty of times, how Marcus Freeman is very, uh, I would say cagey when he talks about how in terms of like yeah. injuries and like when guys come back and it's very like, you have no idea based on what he's saying. Right. Because, mm -hmm. um, I think because he doesn't want to overpromise or anything, I think that's part of it. Um, but I, I mean, this is just something, and I can only speak for just for what it has been with Notre Dame, but they've had a lot of guys come back and kind of like come back early and have to go and get stuff done again. So I'm not, I'm not even just talking about Riley Leonard just having to get his um, yeah. thing done again. And I don't even know – how who did Riley Leonard's? It's not a criticism of who did the surgery or the rehab or anything. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, that's something that's happened. Like, 
the infamous Kevin Austin, oh, broke his foot. And then he comes back and then it's like, oh, well, he's out with his foot again. And he's out for the whole season, basically. Right. And then like Avery Davis is back from the ACL. Oh, look at him doing a camp up oh, towards ACL again. Right. Like there's been a decent number of those uh, just over the course of time where guys have come back. But I, I just so. I understand you got to be kind of careful with the wording because you just don't know. Uh, you, you don't want to say like, oh, he's going to be back because people recover differently. People have setbacks. You just don't know. Um, but I'll just say one thing. If let's just say they don't have Mitchell Evans and Ben Morrison for the first month of the season. That's not great. Those are two of the best players on the team, right? Like, so I, I just, you know, that's just something that, um, I mean, they could they easily survive without him and do well without him? Yeah, sure. But it's just, would you rather have him? Yeah, heck yeah, you would. And to the other point, though, like, if he does end up, like, participating in fall camp and not, or maybe, like, he gets back, like, a week before the season, this i don't care about this like it he doesn't need reps he doesn't he doesn't need reps he doesn't need to be out there learning the defense he's played a ton of snaps missing spring for him is no big deal it really isn't it's only to the benefit of everyone else below him because because like it would be it honestly it's more important for mickey and for gray uh and for um chance tucker and uh, Michael Bell to get those reps. It's much better for them. That 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 is. It, it, if it was just spring, honestly, it, it is it is it is for the greater good of the team. Because yeah, no, be there's nothing, nothing we can for him. There, yeah. There's nothing we can learn about Ben Morrison at this point. Like literally nothing. He's he's great, right? So, uh, so but it's just the uncertainty of it is what has um kind of everyone a little bit concerned right now. And that's and that's fair. I think I think it's a fair thing. Um, and then Riley Leonard, uh, you you talked about this a little bit with Mike on Power Hour, and uh, we had a question about uh, you know from, from I think it, I think it came from Silverback that was on uh, Irish Sports Daily. He posted some questions that you kind of answered in a, in like an article piece, but I'm, I want to bring it up here. It's kind of frame it uh, the way that he did. Um, and it's about Angeli. Obviously, he's going to be the number one now, uh, or he's going to be working with the ones, uh, you know, most often. Kenny Minchie, the two, CJ Carr, the threes. He had a question. Can Angeli establish himself so firmly with the number one offense this spring that Leonard starts the season as quarterback two? So he's skipping a step there, right? You're skipping spring and then start the season as QB two. Basically, is it could Marcus Freeman... Is there ever a world where he would name Angeli the starter after spring? I don't think so, right? No, no, no. But I guess to that point, is there a is there a way for Angeli to play so well in the spring and like in the spring game that if he continues on that track, L Riley Leonard like kind of can't catch him? Is is there is there a way that that takes place? I think it's as, I mean, it's not very probable, but I, I think it, it there is a small chance that that could happen because you're going to go against Notre Dame's number one defense. And even without Ben Morrison, it's still a, a really good defense. It still is going to be as good as the defenses that they'll face all year, really, right? Like, you could argue that Notre Dame might not play a better defense all season than the one they face in practice all season. So with, especially when you consider there's a lot of new receivers, there's a lot of stuff on the old line. They got to figure out. So if he comes in and navigates going against the number one defense and is like lights out the entire time, then sure. It, it, I mean, that would, it, but he would have to make it so undeniable for that to happen that it just is so, so unlikely that it, it would happen. Like, you don't bring in Riley Leonard to do that 
you know, and not give him a shake because he has to be able to prove that he could do this against Texas A&M on to start early because Riley Leonard has done it. That's just a fact, right? Like people can talk about, you know, certain things about like, man, Leonard, you know, his percentage is this or that or whatever. Well, go back and watch the Clemson game. And he was the best player for Duke. He's the primary reason they won the game on offense was because of Riley Leonard. Go back to the Notre Dame where he struggled for most of the game, Mm. like just about every other quarterback that played. I mean, Caleb Williams struggled against Notre Dame. And when the chips were down, it was like, well, they need scores here. They need to score touchdowns here to get back in the game to try to win the game. Mm. He drove them to touchdowns. And, you know, and a lot of it with, was with his legs and stuff too, right? But still, he was able to do it. Um, and we highlighted that, you know, there's that one throw, that third and medium throw, where he had to fit it in that window over top of like, you know, Junior Tuyahalamaka dropped and he threw it. It's like, if that's an inch off, it's picked or tipped or whatever, right? And it was a perfect throw in that situation. All of a sudden, they drive, score, touchdown, right? So that's just... Angeli has never done that, has never proven he can d- do that. He doesn't, what he did against Oregon State, you know, against the, you know, kind of a mishmash defense, uh, you know, the, with them having a lot of guys out, he doesn't really count in terms of what, what you would do to compare it to what um, Leonard has done in actual games. So, and, and, and him coming in garbage time, even though he looked great, it's not the same. You can't yeah. judge it. So you have to judge it by how he would do against this number one defense. And if he is looking just – sometimes it's just undeniable if someone's just doing that. If it gets to that point, then great. I mean, that's awesome for Notre Dame, right? But that's going to be really tough to do. Um, and – I mean, and whatever, and then we can kind of lead this into the next point. But, like, we just don't know that this is a perfect opportunity for, say, Kenny Minchie to get these reps. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't going to get the reps. Definitely not against the ones. Pretty much all spring. I I bet if Leonard was healthy, Minchie, I bet, would have worked with the number one offense, zero reps. Yeah. Well, now he's going to get some. And he'll probably work against the twos quite a bit. And I think one of these things too, with we've always heard about Mitchie is he's so talented. Like he's so talented. He, he has more raw talent than Angeli, but you know, you, he probably makes more, you know, he's because he's younger and all these other factors, he probably makes more mistakes. He's probably makes some throws that he shouldn't doesn't set the protection, right? Whatever. Right. So, now he gets a chance to kind of like work through his mistakes and maybe all of a sudden by the end of spring, you're like, wow, he can run this first team offense. Right. So you just don't know how it's going to play out and you kind of just have to let it, let spring happen before. Cause there's man, I just, I was almost shocked by the number of people who were like, well, it's Angeli's job now. Like, uh, I mean, slow it down. Like it's just, it's not going to be that easy and and not even to say with the, with the Mitchie stuff, but it's like, and jelly still has a lot to prove. Like it's just, yeah. it, you can't just take what that sample size, whatever, because it's, it's, it's apples and oranges. You know, you, you're, you're comparing complete two completely different things. Yeah. So everything that was previously true about the quarterbacks is still true. You know, like, Riley Leonard still has all those abilities. Riley Leonard still is able to do the things that he was able to do, right? Like, it's not different now. The only thing, and I put this on Twitter, the only thing is that, and you kind of understand this too, because when when you're on a football team, the guy who's there kind of all the time and running the team, the team just kind of builds around that person. Yeah. And the, the the reason you want your quarterback in, in the spring is so that the team starts to do that, right? Th- so that's why you want Riley Leonard around in the spring, because you want the team to start to build around him. The offense starts to build around what he can do. Uh, Mike Denbrock learns what he can do. He learns the things that he is good at. He learns the things that he needs to work on. 
Like that's what you want. Like you want the team to be building around your quarterback's abilities. And they can't do that right now. And the other part is they have been doing that with Angeli. Angeli was the number one quarterback for all of bowl prep, all of it. He has been, he will now be the number one quarterback throughout the spring now, right? So the team has a ton of uh, time and a ton of experience recently with, with Steve Angeli being the guy who's running their offense. So that's the, that's what it is, right? I, I, yeah, uh, J- Jacob Paul says the word I'm looking for is team chemistry, but it, it's a little bit more than that. It's a, li- it's more than chemistry because it, it's, it's, it's chemistry, but it's also like confidence in that guy. Yeah, like they're, they, you just get used to it and you like yeah. it and you start to, you start to mold yourself around it. Like it's more than chemistry with like, the team it's like a lot of the things with the, the what made Ian Book great was because people they had confidence they were like well Ian Book is our guy he is the guy for our team and that helps shape the identity of the team right right and they start to take on the identity of that person yeah. and so it just kind of that's the there's there that's a little bit of a a wrinkle in this whole situation that uh, will just be interesting to follow, right? And look, we don't know, we don't know how the other practices have gone. We don't know how the team has taken to to Riley Leonard, right? Like we've heard things, but we don't really know. We haven't really seen it, you know. And so, unfortunately, we're not going to see it. And so, that's just kind of a wild card that goes into, uh, or that that permeates throughout the rest of uh, the spring, that permeates into uh, summer summer workouts. And then fall camp. So that's going to be something to monitor. So now we're adding that to the uh, the monitoring list. Um, and as far as, you know, your point about Minchie and Carr, it's it's huge for them. More so than Angeli, because Angeli was already going to get reps. Yeah. It's, now those huge. Guys stay engaged. it's huge for Minchie. It's huge for Carr. Carr is going to actually get to get some, like, serious work now. Yeah. Um, so, so that for him, this is a very good, um, this is a, a very good situation. Um, uh, Jacob Paulus says, um, uh, Ian books teammates, I complete trust in him. Absolutely. That's true. Uh, Jacob Paulus says who has the Google sheet of all the things being monitored. Hopefully, uh, someone has set that up. Maybe Rajon can, he's here at every show. Rajon do the thing with the, with the thing. Yeah with the, with the stuff uh we need a we need a, we need a spreadsheet of things being monitored and we, we need to get that going um and so uh just i don't have a good transition for this one jamie i, I messed it up uh but i'm going to talk about our first sponsor uh which is uh we're going to do vsr media today uh, which is founded by Notre Dame football pregame host and Emmy award-winning anchor Vahid Saad Razadeh. VSR Media provides professional and cinematic video and photo. Whether you're looking for a collegiate or pro-level highlight reel, have a personal story to tell, or are aiming to diversify and grow your business, VSR Media specializes in short and long-form video storytelling, social media management, and website design. VSR Media also captures professional headshots, senior and sports photos. Contact them at vsrmediacompany.com. Mention Iris Sports Daily to receive 20% off your first project. Visit them online or give them a call at 574-800-9106. Marcus Freeman spoke to... um, uh, Marcus Freeman spoke to the media on, I guess it was Saturday. Uh, Talked a little bit about offensive line and um, Emil Wagner, you know... They're happy with him. He, they, to me, to me, it sounds like it sounds to me like Emil Wagner is is kind of not close. I'm I'm interested to to get your thoughts on this. Like the way that he's talking about him is it's like yeah, like he, his weight is okay, it's fine. We just want him to keep like competing. We want him to keep getting out there, and and I think that we kind of touched on this the last time we spoke about. How like I think everyone is assuming that uh, if he would just be three ten, he's starting right tackle and he's going to be the guy. It, it sounds to me like Tosh Baker is kind of firmly ahead of him at this point. I was wondering if that was your impression as well. Um, 
I heard it is pretty close. Interesting. And I heard okay. like I heard like that. Ta- I actually heard that uh, Tosh has looked pretty good. Like yeah. and has it. I think probably like having the the path open up for him where he could play probably yeah. helped a lot. But I heard that it's like I heard Emil Wagner has looked good. Mm. Like well, that's so, that's good news. I mean, that's, yeah. that's definitely that's that's so, good. Yeah, so I, I have heard that he has looked good, uh, and that like the the weight isn't like overly concerning, mm-hmm. and that like you know even if he's not uh, with the ones, it is probably more of a reflection of like. Baker being good and like Baker yeah. playing well. And also to like, let's be honest, they want to keep, they don't want Baker to transfer. Like, you know, just what with the depth they have a tackle. For sure. Um, like if, if to say that if Emil Wagner just jumped, uh, you know, Tosh Baker in the next practice in terms of like he's with the ones now and then Baker's with the twos. Baker's probably gone. You know, he's probably looking for somewhere else to play than spring. And I don't think that they certainly, I mean, they, I don't think they would want that to happen. Um, so, but, I, but I heard that it, I heard pretty good stuff about b- both those guys so that they're feeling uh, pretty, pretty good about both of those. So like, I, I know, cause I would say based on what uh, Freeman had said, uh, that you would be like, I don't, I mean, it's tough to say because he's just also, it just seems like whatever, especially because maybe it's because the players and parents or whatever. And then this, this day of NIL, whatever, it's like people are overly sensitive to like hearing about like, if someone's, someone's getting praised, that means they're talking bad about someone or someone else or something like that. So like, for instance, him only mentioning that like Bryce Young physically. And then he kind of like walked it back. Cause he was like, you know, I don't want to say, it cause everyone's got their different stuff. And I don't even think that he was just, and this is just me speculating, but I was thinking that as soon as I, he said that I was like, he's doing this, not just because you don't want to like get people upset about their kind of like, everyone's on a different curve in terms of, you know, where you're at in terms of your development, but also too, like it's just so sensitive with guys. Like, if if some guy thinks like, I I think you look at like, so like Braylon James last year. Mm. If you're always hearing about man Rico Flores and uh, and and uh, Jane Greathouse, these guys are just like they came in ready to go. Like, and that was like such a big topic for all of spring and then fall camp. And then obviously Jordan Faison came in, whatever. And it was like crickets about Braylon James. I mean, should he be more, have been more patient and whatever? Yeah. Okay. Sure. But it's like some guys and some parents and whatever, they're just like overly sensitive with that stuff. So you got to be careful. So I was just, I took note of that because I was like, you just don't want to say, and it's the smart thing, but it's not good for us in terms of talking about what is going on and who's progressing and who's not, but it's kind of the smart way to do it because I just know for a fact that parents, like when they're like, my kid didn't get mentioned here. Like there, there, I, I definitely know there have been guys who have transferred because they're like, their kid didn't get mentioned or like they, they didn't get mentioned in a press conference, and this was like earlier, whatever, not with a Freeman thing it was previously, but like they didn't get mentioned when they were mentioning all one position group and they didn't mention this one guy. And it was like, well, I guess I'm not in the plans and just, and it could have been just like, you know, I just didn't decide to mention, I mentioned six guys instead of seven or whatever. And then just boom. But it's, it's, it's like a thing now. Cause you just got to keep everybody happy. You don't want to lose people that might be players for you later on. So um, it's a weird, like you could say maybe it's being overly sensitive and obviously we'd love for him and for all the coaches to share more, but 
when you're not sharing that much about it, I think part of it is motivated by, well, if I praise this guy too much, then I'm not, you know, this other guy might feel a certain way about it. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely true. And also like, I recommend everyone if, if Marcus Freeman talks like to the media and they post it, I recommend everyone watching it because the way that some quotes get written about is in my opinion, not how it, sh it kind of should be portrayed, but by the way that Marcus talked about it, because Sometimes he'll answer a question and it's just like, you can tell it's like, Oh, I, I haven't really given this a ton of thought. I'm going to mention like this guy and this guy, but you can tell like, I, 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 he's not really like breaking down a position group or he's breaking down, uh, you know, like he didn't mention KVA with that. It's like, you just mentioned Bryce young. Right. But sometimes it's just like, you could tell it's like, ah, he didn't really think this through very much. So just don't, don't worry about it. But, like, yeah. it'll be written as if, like, people will say, like, or I'll see on Twitter, like, hey, he didn't mention X guy. He didn't mention yeah. KVA. He didn't mention uh, Mikey Gilbert. So, what's, what's, I, we heard good things. Yeah. About what's going on with them? It's like, well, maybe nothing. If he just said something in a press conference, you know, like, sometimes he'll go up there and you can tell, like, he, he is talking very analytically about, you know, the guards or, of the linebackers or whatever it may be. And sometimes he's just answering a question to just kind of answer the question, you know? Um, so I think everyone should, should uh, kind of take heed of that. Watch Especially in conference. spring too. I think it's yeah. like very precarious of like guys being like, cause, because during the season there might, there's chances you could like walk somebody back off a cliff, you know? Yeah. But, but in the spring, if guys are like, well, I mean, the Ryan's on the wall for me. Like that happens. And also too, I would not get worried about him not mentioning KBA because I I'm pretty sure KBA is he's uh, a stud. He's a stud. Yes. He's a stud. Yeah. Um, All reports glowing so far. What you just said about uh parents and uh you know that they didn't mention my kid. I do wonder, and I'll bet, and I'll bet it's very hard for parents. Now, I don't know how it was like really when I was younger because my dad was always my coach. So he always knew how I was doing. But I think now parents are very used to like going to practice and having yeah, a lot of access. Being there. Yeah. Yeah. They get all the parents, access. Yeah. They know exactly how things are going. And when you go to Notre Dame, you don't get anything. You get literally nothing. And except for your son coming home and, and you ask them like how to go, like you, you, you would be shocked at how many parents I talk to who are like, I don't know really what's going on. Like he doesn't really tell me or he bear, like he doesn't really tell me what's happening or he doesn't talk about it very much. Those are usually the best parents because they're the most level headed because they're not hanging on every word that Marcus right. Freeman or the position coach is saying and in, in a press conference. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't, they don't know. Right. They, they're not sure. Right. And, but, but the point is, is like the, 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 the players, the kids don't really talk to them and I, and they don't get to go to practice. They don't see it. So they don't see the, the progress or, you know, this is why he's behind this guy, or this is why he is not out there as much. Right. And it, I could imagine it being very difficult. Right. Just like, I don't, I, I want to know what's going on. Right. I sent my kid another day. I just want to know. Like it, it, so I could see them struggling with that, right? So uh, oh, yeah. I want I wonder how Notre Dame kind of mitigates that stuff. And, um, and the thing is too is with all these guys and this is just a reality is that if you're going to Notre Dame and you're on scholarship you were a great player in high school. You were you know not just the best player on your team or one of the best players on your team, you're one of the best players in your city, in your state, in whatever. In the Maybe history of your school, school. you know, yes. like that's usually the guys. case. <laughs> so it's, and it's just like, you know, when you go to the NFL and you're an all American in college and then all of a sudden you're like, well, now you're a rookie again. And you got to just, it's, it's an adjustment, right? It's an adjustment. And, um, you know, there's only so many guys that are just like 
you know, the Kyle Hamiltons, the, the Michael Mayers, they, you know, possibly a KVA, whatever, like those guys that you can walk in and just like, you're like, it, it's, it happens right away because they're just a, at that level, like immediately. And they're just, it's so few. And there's been so many great players, you know, and, and just even just bringing it back to Benjamin Morrison, he was a guy that it was like kind of obvious right away too. Right. Yeah. So they're just, it, it just, it doesn't always happen like that too. It just, yeah. it's very rare. Uh, and Rajon says uh, social media doesn't help. Lots of bad info. Not just that, but there's also people traffic in rumors and gossip, you know, and like that's the, I don't want to say their business model because it's not like a business, but like pe people, people traffic in that stuff. They thrive off of the, the gossip and the rumors and X person said, and this person said, and I heard this, like there's so much of that in the space especially at a program like notre dame which has a ton of attention on it right there's a lot of people who talk about notre dame football right so um it's like that's tough too and that's hard for just if you're looking for information right if you're thirsty for the info or you want to find out like like rajon said i could just you can get a lot of bad info there as well um all right we're going to introduce a new segment called If You Build It. We're building, and today we're going to do it. We're going to build our perfect quarterback. Um, and so we're, we're going to take uh, ba uh, basically uh, pieces from uh, different quarterbacks. I assume we're going to do Notre Dame. Yeah, right? Notre Dame. Notre Dame, Notre Dame quarterbacks. Notre Dame quarterback. We're perfect, build a perfect Notre Dame quarterback qualities from different quarterbacks. We're going to put it together, and we're going to build a, the number one pick in the draft. Um, and this segment is brought to you by ESQ clothing. We're going to build a perfect Notre Dame quarterback and you can build your perfect wardrobe with ESQ founded by Notre Dame alum. God Wang. You've seen ESQ on all your favorite Notre Dame players and coaches with over a decade of making the best custom clothing available. ESQ will help you look and feel your best in 2024 from a perfect fitting suit or sport coat shirt or bomber jacket or that perfect tuxedo for wedding season, check out God's amazing work at esqclothing.com and book an appointment to upgrade your wardrobe today. Mention ISD and get 10% off your entire purchase. All right, Jamie. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we start with you? Build your perfect quarterback. Uh, what, where, where, where do you want to start? Build, build your perfect quarterback. Well, I figured we'd go like this and we go, we'd go back, uh, back and forth and we'll talk about just like okay. kind of just different traits and qualities there. And I think, in, first of all, if you want to take it back all the way, I know there's some people that are a lot older than us who listen to the show that have, you know, certainly watched a lot of great Notre Dame quarterbacks, but I'm only going to mention quarterbacks that I have watched. So you've watched, he, okay. So even to say that, like Joe Montana, obviously I've watched Joe Montana play football, <laughs> but I yeah. wasn't born when Joe Montana played football for Notre Dame. Like, yes, I'm very aware of the chicken soup game and you know, I, you know, all these things that he did and accomplished. I've read plenty of things, I've seen highlights, whatever, but I can't just say Joe Montana, you know, clutch, whatever, pocket, whatever. whatever. I can't do that because I didn't see him. You know, I didn't see him. So I'm basically going like essentially late 80s, early 90s and, and on. So we'll set that kind of parameters there. And I think I start with accuracy. And I'm going to say accuracy, number one to me, is Jimmy Clausen. I, I just I, think... I, I, I a hundred percent. There's no, you can't go any other direction. Jimmy Clausen could put the ball anywhere you want. He, he, every time he threw the ball with, with accuracy and, and, uh, or, or like threw the ball with, with, with time and he's in a clean pocket, that ball is going to be exactly where you want it to be. I, you can't ball remember, placement. Yeah. you can't remember like spin and I'll include deep ball with this as well. 
You know, like I, deep ball as well. He threw the best deep ball at Notre Dame uh, with respect to Sam Hartman, of course. But he could just drop it in a bucket. Uh, so accuracy, Jimmy Clausen, 100%. I, I think that is 100% true. And and I and that was going to be mine as well. So you you nailed it with that one. Um, I think I think we should go with just build here, right? I think we should just go with build, right? And 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 uh, and and Bernie, our guy Bernie, nailed it, right? It's Jimmy. It's it's Brady Quinn. It has yeah. to look like Brady Quinn. He does he look like the prototype. Built, built, he, look, good height, right? Like he's not small. He's got, he's got, he's, he's got the perfect build, never injured. Right. Like all, how many hits did he take in, in Oh three and Oh four, Jamie, just getting his butt whooped all over the place. Never got hurt. Never came out. That was one thing about, about Brady Quinn that people don't talk about as much. They talk about all, you know, the other things, but it's like a very tough, durable player. So he's got to have the accuracy of Jimmy Clausen. He's got to be built like Brady Quinn. Uh, where, where do you want to go next, Jamie? Let's just talk about arm strength. Okay. And, you know, I was debating this one, and I thought about my guy, Jarius Jackson, because Jarius oh. Jackson could rip it. Yeah. He could rip it. But I went with Deshaun Kaiser, because oh, Kaiser, okay. I think, if you look at the totality of some of his throws that he made, we were like, man, he could he could really sling it. Um, and I think you could argue that maybe like Jerry's Jackson, if you just straight fastball, maybe he is the more of the fastball, but just the totality of like the kind of throws that you were like this in a tight window in like Kaiser to me was the one. I see for, for arm strength, I'm going with, uh, Zaire Malik Zaire who could just, he did have a big arm, yes. Chuck. I mean, just Chuck. I mean, and, and he's a perfect quarterback for Will Fuller, too, because Fuller could just uh he could just outrun under anything. And he he could he had the ability. He did this in a in a spring game. He 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 threw he threw the deep ball like the one like really good deep ball to uh to Fuller against Virginia, the first one, the the, the first touchdown to make it, uh, I guess it was 1914 at the time just chucked it. And, and the guy in the booth is like, I thought he overthrew him, but then he didn't, he did it in a spring game against Nick Watkins too, the 2015 spring game. Well, I was like, man, Nick Watkins, like he just had no chance to, to, to run with, with Fuller on this one. And the way he placed it, like to me, if he had the arm strength of Zaire with the, um, with the, uh, with, with the accuracy of Clausen, I mean, now, now you're cooking with gas, you know? I mean, that's a, that's like, it, it, that's a that's a like Clawson would have had a longer career, you know. If he, yeah. I mean, without all the other stuff, if he had the arm strength like that, because that was his thing. He didn't have the strongest arm, but he was super accurate. Um, Jason Smith said, "Didn't Golson have a cannon? Uh, he had he had a good, he had a good arm. arm. But he didn't have like a cannon, cannon, you know. Uh, like his 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 intermediate routes, like his over the middle throws, like he could he could really plan it. So he he could really." Uh, throw seeds on those jamie uh people i would say if you were gonna say pure thrower just pure throw over the football yeah golson i mean it's golson or clausen golson or clausen okay all right uh let's do let's do legs let's do legs jamie who what kind of what kind of legs are you looking for here I mean, this is the one thing. It's this one is very tough because there's obviously there's so many guys, and like you could go back to obviously Tony Rice. Um, Tony Rice. You know, obviously, it, 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 you know, he was the first quarterback that I can remember watching, actually watching games of, um, you know, and certainly a very talented runner. I mean, you could even, I don't know if it's kind of cheating, but you could even go Arnez Battle. Because Arnez Battle, when he played quarterback, was a he great quarterback. tight. He was a dynamic runner, and obviously Jerry's Jackson was a gr- great runner, more of a power runner. But like he was a great runner, um, and Ian Book too d- deserves to be mentioned. He does because he had an ability to kind of make guys miss and do some things, and was a far better athlete than a lot of people gave him credit for. 
but you got to go with Brandon Wimbush here, I think, because he's just there just wasn't anyone like him who had his speed, ability to kind of break tackles, ability to kind of break it for long ones. He just had this that kind of extra gear that he could take it to. Um, I would say his 2017 as a runner was better than any other one that I can think of in terms of just the quality of runs that he made just to, you know, get first downs and not just the big plays, right? Like mm -hmm. he, would, for me, he was the guy that I think would scare defenses the most, you know, as a runner. Yeah. He had, so he had the, the, the long speed, right? Where he's a guy like the, like the Boston college game. We're just like running for 200 plus like that's like he just had a guy it's like you get him out in the open it's like this is dangerous you know um so i i, I could i could see that it, it does riley leonard count because i kind of i yeah. kind of i i if i can't pick riley leonard i'm gonna pick wimbush but if 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 riley leonard had played like two games for notre dame or like a game for notre dame i, I might pick riley leonard because he look, he's the closest he, i think to wimbush yeah he is and he's bigger too that's the yeah. other thing like he he is a big guy and he is i'm telling you people like and this is the thing with his ankle too where it really needs to get better because th his a lot of his value comes in the fact that he can run and he he can really run i mean he like he's a long speed guy he's a short yardage guy he is he can hit home runs now, i mean look i picked him to rush for over a thousand yards you know so like I, I, I certainly feel like he can be the, the best runner that Notre Dame's ever had. Honestly, I, I do think that. Um, but you, I, I agree with you. You got to go with Wimbush. He was a track guy. I mean, he ran track in high school and he was a good 200 meter runner. Um, I, I do think you need to have legs like his. Um, and so that that's kind of where I, I would go with that. Um, how do you want to, how do you want to, uh, how do you want to choose like, uh, like heart or IQ or how, how do you want to evaluate that? Like moxie, competitiveness, uh, brains, uh, how, how, which one of those, how do you want to do? It? I think we could go moxie. Cause that kind of is like clutch. That's kind of like, um, clutch, you know? Yeah. Let's go, let's go clutch. All right. So you have the clutch gene. I, I think this is where you throw in, you throw in McDougal here, I think. I think, I think this is where you throw in there, McDougal. Yeah. You throw in McDougal here. You got to throw in Rice. You throw in uh, – I'll throw in Ian Book in this as well. And so with Ian, I think that there's the moxie, the clutchness uh, associated with him. You know, sticking around for as long as he did. Like waiting his turn and, and earning the job. Uh, you know, late comeback win against uh, Virginia Tech, right? Um, just a just a, a quality performer, most wins in the history of the school. Um, you have McDougal, who had the one year in 93, goes, waits his turn. Again, waits behind Rick Meyer, beats Michigan in the big house, in the big game, has a long run, right? Beats Florida State, has the comeback against Boston College, right? Led the comeback, 39-38. Pete Versich, um, if he holds on to the interception, Kevin McDougal is like a, a, a hero and, you know, probably wins a national championship, national championship quarterback. Derek May said he was his, the best quarterback he ever played with. Derek May said this on this show. It's a true fact. Uh, so, so there's that. And then there's Tony Rice, right? Wins the national championship in 88, 89. They beat like nine ranked teams, something to that effect. Went, beat number one Colorado in the bowl game. I, the, the, I, I don't know if this is a shocker. Jamie, I'm going with McDougal. I want McDougal. Like because, because here's, I have some other things. Okay. This, this is another thing that Derek Mays told me. Okay. And I like guys like this. And I know, and I know that you'll understand this as well. Derek May said, best quarterback he ever played with, best golfer he ever played with, scratch golfer, best basketball player he ever played with. When you have a guy who is the best at everything, I want that guy playing quarterback for me. I want that competitiveness. I want that moxie. 
I want that kind of mindset leading my team. And and, and that's what I want. I'm going with McDougal. And, Give me and the not bread. and not like Kim Jong un being being named as the best ever. <laughs> no. Actual, actually <laughs> being yes. yeah. out of school like Notre no, Dame. No it's, fake it's, news. It's yeah. Big. Um I I you know what? As we were you as you were going down the list before with McDougal, I switched to McDougal as well. And I really just I think it is him. I think it is him. And it's just he's only hurt by the play in the one year. That's the thing, right? He's yes. hurt by playing the one year. But I would say that I mean it's awfully close. To me, it's awfully close with Ian Book because man, the guy he is criminally underrated all the time because of you know some of the things that he wasn't good at it, it, to me if we're going to go just like scrambling ability if it's like okay things are breaking down or improvising i'm taking in book as yeah. my in my improvisational quarterback it's like you know escape the rush things breaking down him making a play think about just not just like those little flip plays that he made but just like so many times where you're like, oh my God, it's third and seven. And you're like, gosh, that first read isn't there. And you're like, as soon as you see a uh, book running, you're like, well, they're getting a first down. Like it just was automatic. And then also just, he had a lot of clutch come comeback wins, right? Where he didn't necessarily play good in those games up to that point, but he came through when it mattered. Yeah. Right. So I mean, I, to me, Rajon, Rick Meyer, I don't think the, – the thing about Rick Meyer was I don't know if he was outstanding in any of the categories, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I can – like, I think he was seen as in a certain light because of, you know, there was a lot of like, oh, this guy could be Montana. Because he had great footwork and he was, uh, you know, light on his feet. He was a good athlete. He had a good arm. I don't know if he was the the best at anything, and people viewed him as him having this kind of specialness that uh, you know Joe Montana had, but he didn't really have that. And I mean, to be fair, there's been like four quarterbacks in the history of football who probably had the same thing that Joe Montana had, right? So it's just I, you know, so that's why when he's for me, I don't even think about him and really in any of these terms for this stuff. What hurts, I'll tell you what hurts Meyer. Um, two things. The 1990 season, losing to Stanford, which I don't know if people have seen this. It's on YouTube. On the last play of the game, and I and I found this out, like, I don't know, a, a year ago. Like, I because I found the game on YouTube. I knew I always knew Notre Dame lost to Stanford in 1990, 36-31. And, and it's like you knew that it happened, but you don't know how it happened. Well, it turns out on the last play of the game, uh, Holtz calls roll out, roll right, throw back to the tight end, right? Which is always open. And it was. And Derek, Derek Brown dropped it in the end zone. They would have won the game. There's literally no time on the clock. They would have won 37-36. Uh, uh, so no time on the clock. Derek Brown drops the ball. Notre Dame loses that game. So that's one of their losses. And then in the in the Orange Bowl, uh, Rocket gets the the clipping penalty call back. Yeah. Which had that had that happen, if you won Stanford and Notre Dame won that Orange Bowl, then they're going to be national championships. They could have been national champions had Notre Dame beaten Colorado in that game because Colorado was the number one team in the country and Notre Dame was I think fourth. But the team that that Colorado shared, the Georgia Tech team, it was like. 10 one and one, like they had a tie. Notre Dame had better wins than them. Like there was, you could see a situation where they had shared the national title at that time. Um, so that was a situation where it's like, if they win national title, people think a lot differently about Rick Meyer, but they didn't. And then in 92, when they tied Michigan, it's just like, he didn't do really anything in that game, you know? So that was a tie and everyone remembers the Reggie books run. Uh, and then, you know, you lose to Stanford again, which was, a really bad loss, really not good. I mean, everyone talks about the 92 team, about how that was like the most talented team uh, that Holtz oh might have ever had. I mean, they had – Consider just, all those 93 guys and then – Yeah. Oh, my God. Tons yeah. and tons of talent, right? Like all the 93 guys plus Jerome Bettis 
and and Reggie Brooks and and Rick Meyer, right? So uh, you know it, that, that's just. Uh, I mean, I'm sure tough. Notre Dame historians would probably say like, if you looked at the most talented teams in Notre Dame history, and obviously it's, it's way different eras, obviously, but right. like you know, 46, 47 is considered because obviously they had all those guys come back from right. war and they were just loaded. Like they had, you know, multiple Heisman Trophy winners on the team. They were just, you know, they, they could go, they, they literally would run the ones out and then they'd run the twos out of the thing. They were so deep and loaded um, for those teams. And, you know, it's, it's, a, yes, it's a different era, but that is considered their, you know, that's the, the, the best Notre Dame teams, right, yeah. of all time are those. But, like, I mean, nine, it just straight off raw talent, 92 and 93, it's right yeah. up there. It's right yeah. up there. And it's just, unfortunately, they got screwed out of the 93 title and, you know, didn't didn't win it in 92, right? So um, it's it's unfortunate. But, um, yeah, it's, a, it's always a big what if for Notre Dame. Yeah, Tom Carter. Uh, was on that team. Irv Smith was on that team. Um, forgetting someone. Bettis. Bettis, yeah. Brooks, Bettis was on that yeah, team. right. Bettis like Brooks, so. Uh, it's a very good team. One of the one of the best teams not to win a national title. So, uh, all right, that's uh, we built our quarterback, Jamie. We got we got the build of Brady Quinn. We've got the accuracy of Jimmy Clausen. Got the arm strength. What? Well, where do you want to go? Arm strength. You want to go Zaire or uh, Kaiser? We can go Kaiser. He, he was probably more. He was probably more accurate with his with his arm strength. He, he was he, he was definitely he had the better more accurate arm. So we can go Kaiser there. Kaiser arm strength, um, Wimbush legs, and and like the kind of the moxie competitiveness of Kevin McDougal. And those are that's going to be a good time. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please hit the like. Please hit subscribe. Please hit the notification bell soon. Whenever it is, we are going live. We'll be back on Thursday with more talk about spring ball and uh, Notre Dame football, things of that nature. Look out for a show with Dimes with Dara. We're going to be talking about the first and second round of the NCAA tournament and on to the Sweet 16. So be looking out for that. That'll be coming out either uh, tomorrow or Thursday. All right, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. We'll talk to you soon. Keep hitting and hustling.